So every district in same goal has um, user roles. So depending on your district is going to depend on what you can see. And I know some of you at this point, you don't even have um, accounts yet, which is fine. You can follow along on the screen. This will be recorded and posted. Um, so you will be able to have access to it and go back anytime you need. And I'm sure once you're working in the system, you'll see um, how user friendly it is. Um, once you're in there and, and going. So even if you don't have an account today, you will be completely fine. So welcome everyone. For those of you that don't know me and if you're new to our TCCSA districts, um, my name is Shelly Baltic. I work with uh, the SPED directors and uh, same goal. So I am their contact person if there's issues or problems with it. So, and I, I do the um, trainings as well. So um, we are gonna go through just kind of a quick overview of the same goal and how you can look at students and and create your caseloads and things like that. And remember, um, as I am talking about this, because I just had a couple conversations with some special ed directors before jumping on this call, um, your district might be set up a little bit different. So as I say, you can search for students and find documents that might be turned off for your district. So again, that all depends um, how it's set. So if you're noting, noticing something with what you can and cannot do, that would be a conversation you would have with your SPED director. Okay. Okay. So first of all, we are looking at um, the home screen. So the home screen is recent. These are any of the documents that you have recently looked at. So if you are new to the system, um, this is going to be blank. It is, there's not gonna be anything there, so you are not gonna see anything listed. These will populate chronologically as you open documents, not as you view a student, but as you open a document. Um, so that's how this screen is generated. There's really nothing that you can do here sorting wise. Um, you can't filter out anything but what you can do from here is you can star and unstar important documents. So if you're working with a new student, um, the star and unstar creates the caseload, which we will do here in a second. You can see if the document's been completed. So that is this little, that is this little lock right here. Um, that is gonna tell you if the document is completed or not. Oops, didn't mean to click. And then, um, you can see if there's any attachments. So I like this feature because you can actually see that there is an attachment and it how many there are. So in the previous system, you actually had to open up the document in order to see it. Well, this will populate the number of attachments. Then these are live links. No matter where you see the student's name or you see the document name, you can click on those to either open the document or open the student's profile. Okay, so um, when you're looking at this, so I can quickly get back to some of Isaac's documents if I needed to just by clicking on them. We're kind of going to look through our navigation first before we start creating our and looking at the document itself. Um, so our caseload, how do we create a caseload? Well, we're gonna skip that right now because we need to look at a few other things before we actually get to our caseload. So one of them is the all. So when I am looking at all, this is gonna show any students that are available to you. So depending on, um, depending on your access, you might have access to the middle school, you might have access to the high school. Those are the students that you're going to see and the documents, depending on the user role that's set up, you might be able to see all the 504s, all the ETRs, all the IEPs, all the progress reports, or you might only see the IEPs that you have created. So again, this is based on how the user role is set up for your district. These students are listed alphabetically, so you can't change the order of them. And you can see, again, I'm in a demo database, but you can see here that it is sorted alphabetically by last name, and there's multiple pages of students. Because Jonathan here, he 
poor kid has all these documents. So I'm only seeing two students on the screen at once based on the amount of documents. Um, also, it depends um, for you guys, depending on what district you're at, how many years you've been using same goal. Some, this is only going to be the second year. Some, you've been in it for two, three years now. Um, so that's, again, going to show depend or depending on how many years, how how um, many documents are going to be listed there. From this screen, I can do multiple things. Um, again, I can start and unstart any documents. I can see if they're locked. Um, but other things that I can do is I can just see all of my incomplete documents. So if I want to say, okay, well, you know, which ones are not complete yet? Maybe I need to work on some of these. I can say, show my incomplete documents, and it's going to populate all of them. And you're going to see none of these are going to have that little lock symbol. So even as I go through, um, you're going to see no locks. Okay, so we're going to go back to all documents, and then the next filter I have is for specific forms. So depending, uh, you might be um, a speech uh, therapist, so you might be working with uh, the progress report, so you only want to see progress reports. Um, you might be a school psych, and you're going to be working with the ETRs. So you, by default, it's going to show you all documents, but if I clear this and I just want to see um, my ETRs, I can click here on my ETR and say, okay. Now, as you're sitting there watching me struggle and trying to find the ETR, you will notice that you have this search box. Okay. So the search box is nice as long as get comfortable with the name of some of the documents, because I can't just type in ETR because that's going to bring up the ETR summary. So I need to know that it is an evaluation. Same with IEP. I can't just type in IEP. I need to start typing in individual. Okay. So the search is nice because you don't have to go through all of those documents, but you have to make sure you know the full name of all of the documents. Okay. So once I have that selected, I'm going to click OK. You're going to see my list is completely going to change. It's a lot shorter because now it's only showing me those ETRs. Okay. So, and again, if I am working on one, if I am working on one of these ETRs, I can star it from the screen. Okay. We're going to go back to selecting all. Also, one thing that I want to mention is when we are looking at our forms, we have um, two different types of progress reports that are used. So depending on what district you are, um, you might see one or both of these, but always talk to your special ed director to see which one they would like you to use. The OP6A um, is the one that we are familiar with. It was in the old um, SPS refresh through progress book um, and works along with the OP6B for the transition. Um, the new one in same goal is just called progress report. Um, and this one allows you to do um, graphs. So some districts liked it, especially at the elementary level, so they can um, uh, do their progress monitoring and show a graph. So again, based on what your district is using, you might use one of those two. So talk to your special ed director to know which one you should use. And then depending on um, what you are, uh, what position you are in, you might also want to narrow it down by building. Now, this is a demo database, so none of our districts have this many school buildings. Um, but if I just picked one of the buildings and let's see, I'm going to say, we'll do Deer Run Elementary, click OK. And you can see that my kids at that school are going to populate. Is anybody on here from Hillsdale? I don't think so. Hillsdale's are only tricky ones since their building names just changed. Um, so we're still having a few little issues with those. Okay. So that's how you navigate um, your all screen. You can also find things within a certain date range. So if I want to see, um, we'll do August 1st to August 31st. And there's no documents. Of course, there wouldn't be. Let's go back. 
there we go. So anything that is dated between March 1st and August 31st is going to populate. So you can populate that here as well, or you can search by a student ID. So if you have the student's ID number, you can just plug that in and it's going to populate that student. Now, remember I said anytime you see the student's name and the document, you can click on it to get into either the student profile or the document itself. Okay, so before I do that, let's skip down to students. So this is your student search. This is where all the students are listed. Now, as you see these, you see a lot of students with um, SE. So the SE stands for special education. You will also see AL. Those are your advanced learners. So if your district is using these for WEPs or WAPs, um, those will populate. If you are using these for 504s, you will see the little 504 badge. And um, I don't think anybody is using these for their RIMPs, but that would be your literacy. And the only other one that does not have a badge that they are working on getting a badge for are your English language learners. Um, so that currently they are not badged. Okay. Some other things that you will see with the students, of course, you'll see their student name, but you will also see their student ID number. So that is their number from, it pulls from Dazzle. So all the information for the students, the student's name, ID, their address, parent contact, all that information pulls overnight from Dazzle student information, whatever you're used to calling it. So it updates every night. So it always has current information. So if I want to search for a student, I can just come here, first name or last name. So I'm going to be working with the student. His last name is Logan. So I can, oh, hold on. Eh, sometimes it just needs to refresh right in the middle of a training. Okay, so let's try that again. I'll type in Logan and I'm going to hit search. So once I click on search, you can see that it populates his name here. So I can click on his name and see if he has any documents available, which he does not. Okay. If I go back, um, any of my high school um, ISs, if you are going to be working with high school kids, you might have to get to somebody that has graduated. So those are going to be inactive students because they are no longer in the school. So if I click on that and hit search, oops, let me narrow this down a little bit more. You can see there's a lot more students that have the last name that begins with L now that I have inactives. So if I search here, I have one. If I click on it, I have multiples. And you will see this little sil silhouette next to their name that is showing that they are historical um, or it might say withdrawn um, for any of our graduates. Um, Right now, currently, I know Loudonville, you guys are starting next week. Uh, Mapleton, Orville, Worcester, you guys are starting in the next couple days in Triway. Um, right now, these are going to say uh, pre-enrolled. You're going to have a little silhouette and it'll say pre-enrolled. It's just saying that your student is going to be active, but they are not active until the first day of school. So don't panic with that. Um, your little silhouettes, I believe, are filled in solid where these are hollow and they say historical, which means they're inactive students. Okay, so just a few things with, with looking around and navigating. So I also can get to a student by clicking on my student list. So if I click on Kylie here, notice she does not have a badge. So I want to click on her. But when I click on her, you'll notice that I have documents in here for her. Okay, so the question is, why doesn't she have a badge and all my other students do? So this is a newer student. This is her first IEP, so the IEP has not been completed yet. So once this is completed, so you'll see the little lock, then it will populate the badge. So as long as the student has one document created within that category, so either special ed 504 um, or advanced learner, that's how the badge gets populated. Okay. Then you'll see other little things like these little red dots. And I'm going to go back to my all students. Um, let's see if we can find one. Um, let's go here. So the red dot means it's 30 days overdue. Or I'm sorry, it means that it's uh, overdue. 
So you can see here, if I hover on this, it's showing me that it was overdue since May 23rd. Um, if you see an orange dot, it means it's 30 days. Um, it will be coming due within 30 days. And the yellow dot, and I might have those two backwards, the yellow dot is 10 days. Okay, so be aware of those. That just means you have due dates coming up. So let's look at a student. So I'm going to use Kylie as my example for right now until we start writing our document. So once I click on her name, no matter where I click it from, if I'm on the recent tab, if I'm on all, or if I'm on students, if I click on the student's name, it's going to take me to their document screen. So this is going to show me all the documents that I can see. Now, if you are clicking on somebody and your intervention specialist says, okay, you're going to have Johnny as a a student on your caseload this year and you click on Johnny's name and it's completely blank, that's probably how the user group is set up for your district. You can, some districts only allow you to see the documents that you own. Okay, so if you are not the owner of it, it will not allow you to view that document. So just let your special ed director know that and they can change the settings. So I point that out because I want you to see here, I can see who the owner of different documents are. For those of you that are new to the system, um, you will see some uploads in the system. These were the previous documents from the old system. So depending on when your, your um, district migrated to the new system, um, you might have two to three years of uploads in here um, that are viewable. So you can only copy and paste from them, but um, they are still available for you to see. Okay, so now if we want to look at a document, I can just click on it and it's going to open up that document. Okay, so everything will populate here. We're not going to um, edit this yet. We're going to go back to her screen. And you'll notice you have some of those same items that you had on the all screen. So I can look for my incomplete documents here. I can filter out from a specific type of form. So right now, Kylie doesn't have many documents. So using the filters is not super helpful, but it is available. Um, it is available when your students get a longer list. Okay. You will also see the deadlines. So deadlines are available for all the students if they have a completed document, such as Cole. If I go to deadlines, it's going to show me what is overdue, um, who it is assigned to, okay, and what type of document it is. So if I click on the little drop down arrow, um, you can go to each of these parts of the document um, just by clicking on them. Notice your deadline says it will not create deadlines for documents that are not complete. So it will populate this screen once you have a completed document. Okay. So if I am searching for students, so for example, I'm just going to pick Zoe here. Okay. Notice Zoe is not in my list. Okay. If I click on Zoe and I'm like, oh, well, she's going to be part of my caseload this year. Okay, so I'm going to work, I want to work with her IEP and her progress report. So I want to see both of those documents. So I'm going to click and hit a star. Notice as soon as I star one document from that student, notice it populated her name in my student list. So that is how you generate your student list. As soon as one document is starred, if I go to my caseload, I will now see Zoe here. Okay, so now she's part of my caseload, as long as I have one. Now, if we look at Zoe, Zoe had multiple documents, but maybe I have nothing to do with the ETR and the parent invite. I don't need to store those documents because I can always get to them if I need to by coming to Zoe's documents tab. The one that I'm going to be working on is the one that I want starred, so it's in my caseload. So now if I need to go into this, it will allow me to. So let's look at our recent. Looking at our recent, okay? Notice Zoe's name's not at the top because I didn't open her document yet. So if I go in there and I open her progress report, okay, so our progress report is open. Now when I go to the recent tab, you'll see that it populated her uh, progress report at the top as well as her IEP because it populated from the IEP. 
Okay. So that's how your recent works and that's how your caseload works. So maybe now say it's the end of the school year and you are done working with Zoe. So she's going to be off your caseload for next year because she's moving to the middle school or maybe from the middle school to the high school. So once I am done working with the student and their documents, I'm going to click on the star to remove them from my caseload and notice that Zoe was removed from my student list. Okay. That doesn't mean that I can't go back to students and search for Zoe and find her and see all her documents. I just don't have any in my caseload or my student list since I'm not working with her any longer. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Any questions with navigating finding students or finding documents? Okay, I'm going to assume that uh, the sound of crickets means that you don't have any questions right at the moment. So let's go on. I'm going to go back to finding Logan. So Logan is a new student, and I'm in charge of writing his, uh, his first name's Dakota, but um, I'm in charge of writing his document. Okay, so um, it will only allow you to create an IEP if the original IEP has been completed. So in this case, Dakota is a new student. He doesn't have any documents to work with. If I was working with Kylie over here, her IEP has not been completed, so it will not allow me to create another one. Okay, so just be aware of that. Okay, so how do I create up at the top? If I click, I have all the documents that are available to me. So again, depending on what your district is, um, is what is going to be available on the screen. That doesn't mean you have access to create all these different types of documents. Um, your user role that uh, your district has set to you will determine what you can create and what you can't create. So I'm going to create an IEP. So once I have that in context, I can click on create and watch my student list. Once I hit create, you will see that Dakota is going to be added because once I create a document, it automatically stars that document for me, puts them in my caseload and generates them on my student list. So it does that all for me all at once when I hit create. So now once I hit create, um, you are going to see different things here. So. Um, hold on. I have to check something. Let me just check here. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to do that before the training. Um, all of their contact information, again, will populate from Dazzle. So as it updates overnight, if mom comes in and says we moved, um, she gives, you know, the office their new mailing address, it will populate the new information. If the document is already created, so you've been working on this for two months, mom comes in and says, oh, we just updated our information. There is this button right here at the top that says update the student parent information. It will update the students overnight, but it will not change a document without your permission by clicking on that button. Okay. Anything that has a star next to it, means that it's a required field. And of course, all of these things are going to, um, all these things are automatically gonna populate. So then once you start entering your information, such as my meeting date. So my meeting date is going to be August 18th. You will see that that star disappears. If I try to type something in correctly, um, Say I when I typed the year and I typed it in wrong, you are going to get this big red dot that said it's an invalid date. Okay, you will also get that if you try to um, hold the meeting after, and you know the one year minus a date. So anything like that, if you see the big red dot, that is an error. Okay, but if it's the little red star, that means that it's a required field. So as I'm going through this, if I am working um, with my students, so if I say is the student of preschool age, you're going to see that that is going to disappear. 
Then if I am working here on my LRE, it is going to show that my student is of preschool age. So it wants me to add the preschool LRE. So you'll notice the dot there, and it's saying because I selected this on the cover page, I should be adding this one. So if I click on that, here is the information for my preschool age student. If you click on the wrong one by accident, I can remove it by clicking on the X. So once I click on the X, it's going to say, are you sure? I'm going to say OK. It will remove this whole box as well as any content that you had typed inside. So you really don't want to remove it um, unless you know, you don't have anything in there because it's going to delete the content as well. And then you can see it goes back. Also, this is one of the biggest things that is missed constantly is the outcome ID is here as the drop down. So a lot of people skip over this because it's so small. I wish they would make it bigger or space it out a little bit more, but make sure you see that. If I go back to my cover page and I choose that the student is not um, uh, not in preschool, you will see that that dot is going to change for my LRE and it's now for a school age student. And once I'm in my school age, once I click on it, it's going to have the questions for my school age student as well as saying, hey, we need to add, you know, our testing information, our exemptions, and so forth. These are all add components. So like I said, any place where you can add something, you can also remove it, but it will remove the component as well as any of the content inside. So some of the questions um, that are required, they are, they're not removable. However, the difference between this system and some of the older systems is if I do select something accidentally, which IEP by third birthday was a common one that accidentally got clicked. If I say yes, if I click on it, it again, it will remove it. So it's kind of like the on off. Um, two things that are new here on your cover page is the autism scholarship or the John Peterson program. So you're like, well, that's not supposed to be there. That, I, that doesn't belong there. No, it doesn't. Um, but it is something that is EMIS reportable. So um, the purpose of this is when I am working on this, I can check if that applies to the student. But when I go to my little print symbol and I go to my cover page, you will notice that that information is not here. So it doesn't show there. But because it is EMIS reportable, if I go to my little print symbol and go to my EMIS at a glance, you will notice that, that those options are listed up here for the EMIS page. So again, it looks like it's something new or something different to the IEP. It's just where they placed it so it could be selected for um, EMIS reporting purposes. Okay, um, so now we're going to go and we are going to work on some of our goals. Okay, so I want to show you the goals section. So, you know, you can add, so each goal that they have, you would add a, a goal area. Each of these areas um, you can type in. It does not automatically number them, so you do have to number them yourself. But what I do want to show you is creating banks. You have the ability to create banks and to organize your banks. So as you are working here, um, you can see that I have some created already. But if I wanted to create a bank, I would click on edit. And then I'm going to say add. So I'm going to add a bank. So when I do this, pretend you don't see me doing this. When I do this, um, I am, if I need the student's name, I'm going to use the square brackets. So square bracket name and then square bracket will be able to dot, dot, dot. When you are creating your bank, no matter if you are working in with a male student or a female student, always use the male pronoun because it knows how to automatically change from the male pronoun to the female pronoun. So... Okay, so once I say done, you're going to see it's going to populate.
Hold on a second. I did that backwards, add and then done. No, yeah, there it is. Okay, so now notice that when I create it, it just creates it and stores it here in my bank area. It hasn't applied it yet into the field that I want it to go. If I want to use this, now I click on it and it'll populate that. But if I go to this one, you'll notice that that bank item is not available. It, those bank items are only available in the area where you created them. Okay, now here's a nice feature. So if I switch between students, so if I switch to Kylie, you're gonna see that it's automatically going to switch to her document. And it takes me to section six. And you will notice that it automatically switches from Dakota's name to Kylie's name and notice it switched the pronoun from he to she. So it, noted, it knows exactly how to do that, okay? So again, when you're creating it, use the male pronoun to create your banks and it will automatically adjust to the female pronouns as needed. So if you want to organize, so maybe you are an elementary IS and you're going to be working with the different subject areas, reading and math and so forth. So I want to keep my, I want to keep my goal um, bank items organized. So once I've created a goal or a bank item, I can click on edit. And then you will notice here that above my option is an advanced. If I click on advanced, it allows me to put it into a topic area and or use a keyword. Okay, so for example, in this one, notice that this is a short little plop template for reading. If I click on it, it's going to populate all this information. Well, I don't want all that information in my bank, so I just called it plop template, and then it'll produce all that information. Okay, so if I go back into advanced, if I put this in reading and I say done, now you'll see that my bank item is gone. Okay, so let's go back down. If I click on the drop down, now I have um, a topic called reading. So think of topics as folders, but if I click on reading, now look how many different goals I have in my bank item. So your topics are just ways to be able to organize your goals or your banked items. Okay, so, and your, your bank items can be in multiple places. So it doesn't just have to be here. You can always, you can even bank the numbers if you want to, you know, for your goals and so forth. Okay. And then, like I said, if you um, click on advanced, you can always change the keyword. So, you know, the keyword is just a short little blurb about what the bank item is going to be. If you want to remove one of your goals, you can just click on the X. It's going to say, are you sure you want to remove that bank item? And I'm going to say, okay, and it will remove it. Any questions with creating banks? Okay. So next thing I want to talk about is within the document itself. And again, this is based on your district. So depending on how it is set up for your district, um, uh, will determine what you need to do here. You might need to share these documents with a related service person. You might need to share it with another intervention specialist. Again, all depending on what your district prefers. So over here on the side, I have a share button. So this share button, oh, let's go back to, uh, where's Dakota? This share button um, allows me to share with people within my district, and it also allows me to share with uh, people, with parents, okay? So if you notice when I'm looking at um, the print preview for my student, if I go up to my little printer and I wanna look at it, it's gonna have the draft watermark, 
Okay, so until the document is completed, it will say draft. Okay, so when I'm looking at this and I want to share, if I want to share somebody within somebody within the district, okay, so I want to share this with her, you'll notice that it says new. So this means I have not saved. Everything up to this point has been auto save. This screen does not auto save. So we're making our um, collaborative team so we can all work on the same document together. So I'm going to allow Rebecca to edit this document. You might want to share this with a gen ed teacher so that they can only view it. So or uh, maybe this student is moving from the middle school to the high school and you want to change ownership so you can switch ownership to the new IS. Okay, so I'm going to leave that as view for Rebecca. I'm going to hit save and you will notice the new will disappear and it is now shared with her. So what that does for Rebecca is it automatically stars Dakota's document and puts that student in her caseload. Okay. And again, some districts you do have to share with your related service people. Some districts it's open so the related service people can find their documents. So again, talk to your SPED director. They'll let you know um, what way is best. But again, and sometimes it's not, you know, it's not a related service. It might be a gen ed teacher or something like that. So the other thing that I want to show you is sharing with parents. So we know that uh, we need to get signatures. So, you know, most of our, our meetings are back in person. Um, so, you know, if we have, uh, you know, an in-person meeting, they can sign right then and there. If, you know, we don't have an in-person meeting, maybe we're doing it via Zoom, um, you know, we still need to get that parent signature. So there is a digital way that you can get that done. So I'm going to add, um, so this is, okay. and then I'm going to add mom. Okay, so, and I'm going to put here, oops, I didn't mean to do that. See, I accidentally clicked on it instead of clicking the drop down. So because it's an add component, it allows me to remove it. So if I click on that, I can say I'm the IS, and then I'm going to say I'm the parent. Okay, so that's all ready to go. And again, if you're in person, you have the digital signatures right here, but maybe mom can't come in, so you're having a Zoom meeting with them. So if I click on the share, there's a button over here that allows me to share with parents. Okay. So first name, last name. Um, if you want the parent to, if you want to be formal with the parent, Okay, and then this would be their last name. Okay, if you don't want to be formal, you can just put their first and last name, but this is how it's going to um, um, greet them in the letter that is going to be emailed to them from same goal. So I'm going to put mom's email address in here. And then I have the option to allow them just to view it. So maybe if you're working on it, instead of mailing it home, you might email it. Or I can allow them to view it and sign. Okay, so I'm going to leave it as view and sign so you guys can see that. I'll say. Okay, and then I'm going to send this off. Okay, so if I look at my share, it does show me that it's been sent to mom. Okay, it doesn't tell, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you when you sent it, but once mom's name is uh, populated there, you know that it was sent at some point in time. So let me pull up my email real quick. So when I am looking at email, Don't look at all up my unread. It forwards to my other email. So you can see it comes directly from same goal. So you would want, you know, mom or dad to know that it's coming directly from same goal. But it says what it is. It's the IEP and then the message of the document. So once I click on that, you can see, see how I put Mrs. with the first name. So it populates. So it's a little bit more formal. 
And then this was that optional area that you don't have to type in. Um, you know, I said, look this, or we'll look this over and sign it at the meeting. But then here is a link to the document. Okay. So as mom, I'm going to click on this. I'm going to say, are, are you sure that you are who you say you are? Oh, why is it doing that? It's not supposed to let, do that. Hang on a second. Give me one second. Just confirming everybody can see that. Okay, I'm going to go back into my document, click on it. Okay, so it's confirming that I am the parent of Dakota Logan. And I'm going to say, yep, I agree. Now, here's the nice thing when you're working with this. Okay, notice at the top. So I'm looking at this as the parent. So I can go through it. Notice I can't click on anything. I can't make any changes. It doesn't allow me to. But I can also see that Shelly is in this document. So if I switch, let me see if I can. I have way too many windows open. Um, so if I'm in here, so the black at the top is me as the IS, the white is mom. Okay. So I could see that mom is in the document. So if you're talking to them via zoom, they might not have their camera on or, you know, they, they might have their camera on their phone and they're working on their computer. If you don't see this little symbol, you know that they're not in the document. So you're saying, you know, look for that email, click on the document, and then they're in. Okay, the nice thing is though, as I am working on this, I could say, okay, mom, let's, you know, let's let's look at all the dates. Are all these dates okay on the, the cover? Yep, everything's good. Let's go to the goals. Is this goal good? Notice wherever I click, it's moving mom's screen. So it's telling me, hey, Shelly's in this document, in this goal, and it moves the screen for mom. So I'm like, okay, if you're good with everything, let's go to the signature page. And as long as I click on something for mom, so I can click where it says mom's name, I can say, you know, see the little pencil and mom can click on that. That's one place that mom is allowed to um, click on. And then she can type in her name. And then she can sign. Oh, I'm horrible with my mouse. And then she has to certify that she is signing um, digitally and say adopt. And you can see as soon as mom says adopt and sign, it populates it on my screen right away. Okay. Mom also has the option to put in today's date. So whatever date the meeting was, I think we said the 18th, it populates it on both of our screens. So again, that's one way to um, to get parent signatures if they are not face-to-face -face for a meeting. I know this is not used as much for IEPs now that um, most parents are coming in face-to-face, -face, but this is still used quite a bit for um, written education plans um, because parents don't always, there's not really a meeting set up for that, so they're sending them this way. So again, it's just an option. I want you to be sure that you can... Um, you know, see that it's there. So mom is now going to close out of the document and you can see it takes the M off of here. So I know that mom has closed out of that document. Okay. Okay. I, oh, then um, last thing, and then I am going to open it up for questions. So we talked about printing. So you can print the full document. You can print a section of the document. You do have, um, this is nice, and I, I know we have a building principal on here, but this is nice, IEP at a glance. So that is just going to show um, just the basics that that uh, gen ed teacher would need. So the goals, um, the, any, any services that are provided for the student, and any accommodations are going to be listed here. So... Um, Staff, Gen Ed staff used to have access to the IEP summary page, which was the in SPS. So this is the same thing. So if your teachers don't have access to it, you might want to provide this to your Gen Ed teachers so they have it for all your students. 
Um, but it's a nice way to just kind of glance and, you know, get to know that student a little bit. So those are all your print options. The next thing here is your version history. So we are so used to Google. Your version history will show you everything that has gone on in this document from the time that it was created to each time something was clicked, including mom's signature. So if I click here at this point in time, I clicked here and you'll see that it highlights that area. And then I clicked here, it's gonna show me Oh, it's because I deleted something. I'm like, why is it not moving? Um, it's so every time, every place that I click, it's going to highlight those areas and say, okay, well, this is what you put in here at that point in time. And then I can click here and I can see when mom actually signed it. So you cannot delete any of these things. You cannot revert to this point in time in the version history um, because it is a legal document, but you can see information. So if something was deleted accidentally and it was not supposed to be, maybe it was a goal, two of you were working on it and somehow one person deleted somebody else's, um, you can come back here, go to that area and copy and paste but it will not let you revert back to that point in time um, at that document. It will not let two people work in the same section at the same time. So if I am working in the profile, once I click on it, it's gonna say Shelly Baltic across it and nobody else will be able to work in the profile. Okay, and you'll see who else is working in the document up here. Okay, so that's the version history. And then last but not least, when you are ready, you can complete the document. It will not allow you to complete the document if information has been missed. So that is this little validation checker here. It's gonna say, hey, you know, you can go through here and look at all anything that you've missed. It's gonna jump right to that section. Um, you can go through. I, of course, didn't complete this document or, you know, type stuff in, so it is not showing. But then when you're ready to complete, um, you would click on the lock and it will lock the document. And it's gonna, it's gonna say it has errors because I didn't fill everything out. Um, but then the document becomes completed. Once it is completed, once it is completed, then it puts the lock there and um, it is ready for you to either, when you're ready to create the next one, or if you need to create the progress report. So if you um, need to create the progress report, it does have to be completed. Then let me make sure this is my student that has information here. I had one that was full. Um, we'll just use Isaac here. Um, so once this IEP is com completed, I can come up here, grab my progress report. And I'm going to do the new one so you can see what it looks like. Um, once I click on create, there's already a progress report created. Let's delete that. Okay. So you'll see that it populates the information from the IEP um, and brings it in to here. So this one, of course, looks a little different than the normal OP6A um, because it does allow you to add this chart. So if I want to add a chart, I can add a chart for my progress monitoring. Um, so if I click here, you can see it has multiple periods. So if I have four quarters, I would type in, you know, And this is seconds and so forth. So when you're printing these, um, you will see that you can print with one or two, three or four. So you don't have to print, you know, the whole document with all eight periods. Um, you can print however many quarters if you're on trimesters, you're on quarters. But the chart allows you to show progress monitoring. So, of course, you're going to add your baseline score. So... We're going to take the baseline today. It was a 25. And then I'm going to add a score for 
from next month is taken here and got a 32. They're on track. Yes, yes. Um, we want the target score. We want, and I'm going to type this in just to make it quicker so I'm not clicking. Um, we want them to get to a 70. So you can see it's it's providing a graph of your progress monitoring. So if you want to add another one, so if this is winter score, you know, this was taken in December. And then maybe they fell a little bit. So no, goal has not been met. And you can see this is where they, st you know, started. This is where we want them to be. And then this is what the student scores actually do. This is why some districts are using this, especially for the elementary, compared to our typical OP6A, um, which I can create that one too. Um, so this is the one that you're probably familiar with. Okay, so this brings over, oh, I did the wrong one, sorry. Like, where's my goal? This poor kid's going to have all kinds of different documents. Come on. There we go. Okay. So there's my goals from um, my IEP. Okay. So again, ask your SPED director which one you should be using, um, but then you, you can add your additional information and so forth. Last thing I'll show you is that when you're done and you're ready, depending on what your district allows, if they allow you to copy from existing, it is now called copy to new document. So if I put a check mark next to my document, go to my actions, I can say copy to new and it will create Notice it will say it'll create except for dates, signatures, and a few other fields, but it will copy it. I'm not going to share with the same people, and I'm going to create my new document. Okay. So then it will populate that document, and it will automatically star any documents that you create. Okay. So that is a quick overview of same goal. Are there any questions? Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, again, I know it was short notice to put this together, but there was a good group of you guys. Um, if you did not earlier put your name and I uh, built uh, district and position into the chat, please do that so I have record. Because um, if your special ed directors, you know, ask me who attended, I have record of that. Because um, I know some of you, um, some of you I did not have on my list. So I want to make sure that I catch everybody and uh, know where you're working. So if you don't have any questions, um, have a great day. Have a great school year. I know some of you are starting as early as tomorrow. So uh, good luck to you. And um, maybe I'll see you in a future training.